Hi all, and welcome to drill number one. I have decided to introduce these drills so you can practice what you learn here at Better Your Chess. Your task is to find the best solution to the position in the diagram. The positions are not so easy, so we will just do one drill at a time. Now, as in a real game, you don't know the truth until you have looked for it. Also, there's no one whispering over your shoulder saying why to move and win, or made in four moves or something like that. No, you're just on your own, and you don't have any information about the given position, apart from the fact that you know whose move it is. So you have to find out yourself what is the problem of the position and what is the best solution for it. Now the positions can be tactical or strategic in nature, so don't be fooled in thinking that you always need to look for tactical solutions. Of course we know that positions tend to be more tactical in nature than strategic, so keep that in mind. And uh, sometimes you can win in these positions, sometimes you have to fight for the draw or try for an optimal defense. Just use the thinking methods you learn here at Better Your Chess. So, start out with an orientation, try to get the gist of the position, you know, get a feel for what's going on. Uh, see at least what's the threat of your opponent, if there is a threat of your opponent. Try to figure out if you can make your move immediately. And if you can't, uh, which is normally the case, then uh, try to find out if the position is strategic or tactical in nature and then just do the uh, appropriate approach, the planning approach or the analytical approach. Okay, so work those out and then choose your move. If you're new here, then I recommend you first go through a number of lessons first and come back for the drills later. Now, of course, with each drill you will be told who is to move. And after the drill, I will give you a sample of quote-unquote correct chess thinking for the drill position in question. You may want to write down your findings first so you can compare. Of course there are some training rules. Set up the pieces on your board or look at the screen and pause the video. You know that drill, right? And if you're at the board, do not move the pieces. Try to see the whole solution by means of visualization and I say also the whole solution, just as you ideally would in a real game, before moving. Try to train yourself in that. Normally always there is this moment in calculation when you just want to move, you know, but if you're not sure or if you don't have enough confidence about the solution and you still have some time, uh, your clock is not ticking away, then use that time and make sure that your solution is correct. Okay, now if you can't get the whole picture and or all the relevant lines, then also try smart thinking, such as, well, in this position I have at least this or that, or I can stop calculating here because this or that, or, well, if nothing else in this position, I can always build out here with this or that, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so here is your first drill. You may have already been looking at it while listening to me. So it's white to move. Good luck. Pause the video. Okay, well, welcome back. Let's compare answers and just listen to my quote unquote a sample of correct chess thinking for this drill position. So it's white to move and if we count the material we can see that material is even as so often in a chess game so we have to start looking for other imbalances. Now if we just stick to the orientation of the position I suppose we can just quickly see that this king is sitting here very weirdly in the center so let me indicate that with red as I normally do. On the other hand, maybe White's King is also a little bit drafty, but it looks more uh, safe in the corner there, or rather in the corner, than Black's King on e7. Okay, also we see of course that Black has two heavy pieces 
cluttered up there at the queen side and they look very weird over there especially the rook on b7 um, is not displaying any activity whatsoever if we look at white pieces however we see that the rook is targeting e6 in combination with the knight on e6 that uh, be it directly with the queen or indirectly with the rook from f1 white is also targeting the f5 pawn so all these pieces are hovering around this area you could say around black's king you know very dangerous and of course also the bishop on f4 has a very active diagonal it's looking indirectly at the rook here on h6 which compared to the bishop of course is a whole exchange and um, the bishop is also looking at the knight and maybe at the pawn behind it okay so that's just you know summing up some of the peace activity that is going on here or maybe I can just use the, yeah this button because I'm still at the beginning of the position so I'm not jumping back to the beginning of the position okay um, also if we look at some of the other black pieces well I suppose we can say that this is a decent rook here right this bishop is maybe also decent even though it is loose and probably black's best piece is uh, the knight on d6 which has some nice squares you know and it's also defending some white squares around black's king which is sitting there very vulnerably in the center as is normally the case with kings in the center in a middle game position with queens on the board okay so um if we do an orientation like that we can already see that well probably white is, is is better here than than black he has the better peace activity uh, the deployment of his pieces is better and um, if that's not enough he has two pawn islands versus blacks three and of course especially these pawns here are very ugly weaklings okay well maybe you've noticed that during the orientation I'm also doing a little bit of uh, planning approach right the first step of the planning approach normally involves uh, just looking at the imbalances uh, for both sides and um, but I will not go through the whole planning approach because I'm still getting the gist of the position here and it may help to do the first phase of the planning approach so um, you are allowed to uh, skip forward back and forward in all the approaches of course but um, let's just say for a moment we're still in the orientation right because that's also what I teach you so then we got some kind of a gist for the position and it's white to move and we can feel okay um, white is much better deployed than black here and uh, if he can't crash through anywhere then probably he has the better end game because of these weak pawns etc etc now I suppose we should also ask ourselves the question is black threatening anything well Threatening anything is maybe a big word, but at least Black would like to deploy his pieces better uh, before White can maybe start an attack. So, quote unquote, Black is maybe threatening Queen G8, you know, bringing the Queen opposite White's King here and also eyeing the White Knight on G5. Also, uh, from g8, of course, it would be uh, defending these uh, white squares here on e6, uh, most notably, and it could add to the defense of this king position here. Maybe, even though it seems to lose a pawn, maybe at some stage, at some moment, um, black would also like to move knight to e4 but of course we can chop that one off right maybe uh, black would like to move bishop f6 so he can annihilate this dangerous knight from g5 but probably if that move would be tactically correct i suppose that most likely black would like to uh, activate his queen and maybe he could also uh, activate his queen via e8 and then maybe even to h5 you know from where in coordination with the rook he would apply some pressure 
on White's king side there, even though for the moment h2, uh, the specific point on h2, is well defended by the bishop on f4. Okay, so it doesn't seem that black has any threats, but he would like to quickly uh, enhance or improve his position. Well, it's white to move, and um, you can ask yourself, after we've asked ourselves what's the threat, if we can maybe move immediately. Well, I don't know if we can move immediately, you know. Um, I mean, are we in check, and is there an obviously one best defense to the check, or uh, did black just take our queen so that we have to recapture our queen, or is it very uh, obvious that there is just one open file and that we just have to occupy the open file or something? I don't know. At least if I'm looking at this position, I really wouldn't know immediately what to play. So I start asking myself the question, you could say the, maybe the final question of the orientation, what is the nature of the position? Is it tactical or is it strategic? Well, normally every position has some uh, strategical features and some tactical features. But in this position especially, there seem to be a lot of tactical motifs. Well, first and foremost, it's normally a tactical motif if a king is sitting in the center like so. And if that's not enough, we've seen that there maybe is a discovery from the knight, which opens up uh, the f4 bishop towards the h6 rook. Of course, there's also this capture. And then there are these two weaklings here on e6 and on f5. And white is, be it directly or indirectly, and I'm drawing the same green arrows, eyeing both weaklings here. Okay. And, <clears throat> um, you know, also these, these heavy pieces on the queen side, which are having difficulty coming to the aid of Black's king in the center, could be an indication that uh, the time is ripe to crash through here. Okay, now, so having said that, I suppose we can say, or at least assume for the moment, that the position is strategic, uh, excuse me, tactical in nature, and that, of course, we have to start looking for an analytical approach. Well, the first step of the analytical approach is, of course, we do a tactical breakdown, right? So we've already summed up some motifs, but maybe it would be nice to go a little bit deeper. If somehow, maybe we can just try and concretely crash through on the f5 and or e6 squares. Also, we've seen that this is a very important defender, and uh, chess is a very mechanical game. This bishop is still in the way of the rook towards f5. So it would make sense maybe to play bishop f4 takes d6, eliminating that one defender here, and um, opening up the f-file uh, for the white rook. Also, of course, loosening black's grip on the f5 square here. So bishop takes d6 would be an interesting move, and I suppose also knight takes e6 is a sacrifice to look at, or rook takes e6. So we've done a tactical breakdown, and we've tried to come up with some ideas here. And I suppose the idea is just to break through on these white squares, yeah? And I've now already named three candidate moves. Knight takes e6, bishop takes d6, and rook takes e6. And, um, yeah, I think that those are three nice candidates to start with. But then, of course, the question is, which candidate do you calculate first? Well, um, purely on the basis of some logical reasoning and also intuition, I think I would start calculating with bishop f4 takes d6, because it seems to set all the necessary conditions in a more proper way for a possible breakthrough, because it actually opens up the f-file, physically opens up the f-file for the f1 rook, and also eliminates the knight on d6. It might be a wrong move, you know, maybe knight e6 is better or rook e6 is better, we don't know. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. So 
we say to ourselves, in this case I say to myself, I start with bishop f4 takes d6. Okay, now um, let me not uh, visualize the whole solution here. You have done that during your training session. I will just execute the move for now. Okay, um, of course, during your visualization, you would now have to calculate uh, the candidate moves for your opponent. And as you've learned in a number of lessons, calculation is always, all the time, on every ply, about looking for candidate moves, be it for yourself or be it for your opponent. Well, it's black to move here. We just took a piece, so uh, it would make sense that black is going to recapture the piece, right? Otherwise, we're just going to retreat the bishop and go a piece up and be easily winning the game. If you listen carefully, what I'm saying here is an assumption. And uh, it is characteristic for an assumption is that we can never know for sure if it's the truth. Uh, because we're not computers, you can also uh, learn more about assumption in earlier lessons. But we human beings, since we are not computers, we need assumption to make sense of our calculation, right? We somehow have to give direction to our calculation because otherwise we can just try all different 10 or 15 candidate moves or more that black has in this position, right? And that just simply wouldn't make sense because we don't have the brute force as computers do. So once again, we use assumption as the glue of our calculation to limit for as much as possible uh, the candidate moves for either side. So in this case I'm saying to myself I'm taking a piece, he must recapture it if he does not have a very clear-cut counter-attack or a check or something like that, right? Um, maybe we could just very quickly look at a move like rook g6 but then we just see, aha, okay, bishop f4 I retreat the bishop, he can't take the bishop anymore and I'm protecting my g5 knight, maybe I even can protect it with h2, h4, that's just bullshit for black, I'm not going to look at that. Okay, well, well, then what remains really is king takes d6 and of course c takes d6. Now, okay, systematic as we are going to be about it, we just calculate king takes d6 and now I ask you of course to visualize this and maybe you have already done that during your training session after king takes d6 white plays knight f7 check forking both king and rook and um, after the exchange there on h6 uh, white would be the exchange up uh, black's king would still be in the center, black's pieces are looking silly on the queen side, and of course, already from a material point of view, that would be a rather easy winning position for uh, for black. So we're not going to play king takes d6, knight f7, but rather, after bishop d6, the most testing candidate, and of course, if we're honest with ourselves, and we want to learn to play stronger chess, we want to better our chess, we are from now on going to say to ourselves, I will always play in my analysis the most testing move, the most best move for my opponent. You know, I will not calculate myself rich by using false fantasies or something like that. So C takes D6 is then probably the most testing move. Well, I suppose that maybe now is the moment, right? Um, shall we play queen takes f5? <laughs> well, let's not do that. Let's not just sacrifice our queen after e takes f5. What have we got? Right, I don't see any follow-up. Right, okay. So we go back to knight e6 or maybe rook e6? Or maybe rook f5? I don't know. It seems that somehow I want to break through on e6 because if I eliminate the defender on e6, then I can also crash through on f5, right? So I'm giving my thinking a little bit of direction here. So now the question remains, knight takes e6 or rook takes e6? I don't know. Just purely based on intuition or just the way it looks, I would go with knight takes e6. Now these situations are not easy and some grandmasters give you tips on how to calculate here. I know for instance the German uh, chess grandmaster Henrik 
Teske uh, taught me once during a training that he gave uh, during the Bad Wiese Bayern Chess Open in Germany. I think that was already 2002, a long time ago. One of the biggest, if not the biggest, Open in Germany. That um, you should always start with the strongest piece taking the strongest opponent piece. Well, in this case, <laughs> it would be queen c2 takes f5, but okay, that's bullshit. So then it would be rook e1 takes e6. But I played this position in a game, and I remember not looking at rook e1 takes e6, but knight g5 takes e6. And don't ask me why. Maybe just because the rook e1 and f1, they can also operate from a distance and they keep protecting each other. And somehow after rook e1 takes e6, the whole white piece configuration looks a little bit loose. Now I can imagine that maybe during your own drill exercise, you did in fact calculate rook e6 first. Well, in that case, um, congratulations, because it is a good move and a winning move. <clears throat> now, let me just quickly run through the variations here. Or, yeah, yeah, rook e6, and then knight takes e6, and after queen, no, 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 okay, stop. Let me just stop here for a moment. Um, okay, maybe this has to do with some preparation of the video, but Rook takes e6, I will show you later why that is also good. Now let me just for the moment um, focus on knight takes e6, because again, here is a moment, you have to do something, you have to be practical about it, and as I said, I remember during my game, I was just looking at knight e6 only as my main candidate, so I just started calculating that one. So here we go, knight takes e6. Okay. Something similar can happen in a game, right? As is happening now to me as a chess trainer. You sometimes can switch a little bit in your mind, but then you just have to hold yourself back. And knight e6 is just, um, well, I don't know, the, the, the candidate move uh, of my intuition choice here. Okay. Um, now, so knight e6. So far, so good. I suppose um, if we look at the position, I've won a pawn, and I'm also threatening to take on a five. I'm threatening to take on g seven. Still, the king is in the center, so black better do something and do it quick, right? Uh, for else, he's just going to lose this position. So far, knight e six is working wonders, right? <laughs> so it's up to black now to try and falsify my whole combination. And before, before I execute knight takes um, e6, or maybe even before a bishop takes d6, I should also falsify the combination, because if it somehow doesn't work, if I'm blundering my piece here, which for the moment I am sacrificing, then of course I shouldn't play the combination, right? So, and you're in an over-the-board game, all this is of course still going on in your visualization and in your calculation. And Again, it is Black's turn, so we have to look for candidate moves for Black. Now, maybe during your calculation you did so, and you came up with uh, some candidate moves. <clears throat> I remember during the game that, of course, I looked at rook takes e6, right? Which is, I suppose, the main move, because it just takes the sacrificed piece. But, as I told you in earlier lessons, if it's not check, you can do more than just taking, interposing, or moving the check king. You can also uh, support something by means of defense. You can also start an indirect a defense, or you can start a counterattack. And I urge you, in all the lessons, and I will continue to do so, I will urge you to look for counterattacks. Because counterattacks are normally somehow counterintuitive. And counterattacks also very often constitute the strongest possibilities, the strongest candidates of the opponent. And, uh, of course, normally an opponent will never apply with your plans and just go down like a weak sheep, right? So, I urge you to look for counterattacks. Well, the main counterattack, I suppose, here is uh, eating the pudding, right? The proof of the pudding is eating. So rook takes e6 is on my candidate list, in my mental candidate list. But maybe you've seen 
But there are some other ideas here, some other counterattacks, some other defensive methods. Have you seen, uh, for instance, bishop e5? Bishop e5 is blocking the e-file, is counterattacking h2, and maybe just prepares also, because it opens up the g-file, also prepares queen g8 with check and attacking the knight on e6, right? So bishop e5 is on our candidate list also. Well, having said that, I suppose that maybe also the immediate queen g8 should be on our candidate list. Not taking the knight immediately, but just, you know, setting up some threats against the g-file and against the knight, and maybe I'll just take the knight later, right? Um, so, apart from rook takes e6, we also have to calculate queen g8 and bishop e5. Well, let's just start with queen g8. We have it on the board now. It's white's move, and of course, there's a problem with the knight on e6, there's a problem on the g-file, but hey, maybe we can just solve it like so. Knight takes g7. Ha ha ha. Okay, then um, if queen takes g7, I suppose, excuse me, we can just go king h1. And is there something going on here? I don't see any dangerous move here for black. So we've won a pawn in the process and f5 is also on the nomination of being captured. So I think we can just stop calculating here. That's also very important, just to know when to stop calculating here. I may be already talking now for 15 minutes. This is of course by because I, I, I use some extra text to uh, stress matters and to explain everything in detail. But normally when you're doing this kind of dialogue with yourself in silence, in your, uh, in your mind's ear, so to say, um, <clears throat> try and make it shorter, right? But, uh, yeah, so it is important to know where to stop thinking. f5 is also on the nomination of uh, falling, and then we would have a rook end game with two extra pawns, and that king is a little bit weird still on d7, blocking the rook on b7, so would be would be advantages for, for, for white, yeah? Maybe just plain winning. Okay, well, having said that, maybe queen takes g7 is not the best option then. Now, if you're a real good chess player, you may have seen that there is another option here. Of course, it is always uh, very mechanic just to recapture a piece. But we also know that chess is not checkers, and this is very important. And your opponent, and yourself also, by the way, is always allowed to make an in-between move. And in this case, the check with rook g6 in between is stronger because it keeps the queen on this diagonal. Ha ha. So if now king h1, that would be a gross blunder because after queen d5 check, black is all of a sudden winning because of the fact that white's king is cornered there. So after rook g6, you know, of course, there's the candidate of king h1, but maybe you should give precedence to the candidate king f2, exclamation mark. And now after rook takes g7, you have to recapture the knight, queen takes f5, check. We have two extra pawns. Now I suppose you again can stop calculating as soon as you've figured out that uh, you can defend against the possible threat with rook f7. Of course, now first the black king has to move somewhere, but then you can play rook e6 and then defend against uh, rook f7 with rook f6. And um, it's not so bad to have your king on f2 there. Black's king is also bad and your two pawns up, and I suppose your pieces are still working better together. So. You can start looking uh, for some new uh, moves once you have reached this position. You have to stop somewhere, right? And this could be a logical point to do so. Okay, well, having said that, I suppose that covers uh, the candidate queen g8, right? Okay, well, then let's have a look at the candidate bishop e5. 
Well, the most logical move is maybe now to play Queen takes f5, you know. There was also the candidate of taking here, of course. But that bishop is not going anywhere. And it's also nice to have, um, <coughs> excuse me, to have uh, a discovered attack set up here against the king, right? Um, now, I suppose bishop takes h2 is a possible candidate. But then I think after king f2, you should have a winning position here. Uh, that black king on d7 is in dire straits, it can't really move, and um, you're just going to lose this position with black. So bishop takes h2 is not really the way to go. Probably best here is rook takes e6 as another candidate. But then, of course, we take this bishop, and again, we're two pawns up. And after the counterattack, queen g8 check, we now have the rather safe king h1, and the rook on e6 is in a pin, and this position is winning. Okay, so that also covers bishop e5. Now, let's go back to the main move. And uh, it's always necessary to try all of these counter counter candidates because as soon as one of these counter candidates is falsifying your line you know that your combination doesn't work now it's different for your own candidates because you can start with calculating just one candidate because if that move is good enough and brings you some advantage well then it brings you some advantage right then it's up to your opponent to try and falsify it only if you somehow feel, hmm, this is not quite to my liking, or I have the idea that there should be more advantage, then you start looking for your own other candidate move. But I suppose this could be a rule of thumb. It's always good to know what your candidate moves are, but just start calculating with the one that seems to be the strongest, you know, based on your feeling or your experience or, or your, your intuition just a first hand choice okay now after 96 let's look at the main candidate the proof of the punning is in the eating now i suppose the point of the whole white combination is just simply saying ha huh, but i just take that rook and now i'm up the exchange and dear black player you can't recapture the rook because if you recapture aha okay yes i can say you can recapture on e6 but if i'm honest i have to first find candidate moves for you my dear opponent so king e6 of course main candidate but what again about this Queen g8, you know, isn't it threatening? Bishop takes d4, double check, you know, isn't my king somehow getting cornered? And can he then maybe later take the rook on e6? And then is the position still advantageous enough for a win? Aha! So it's not just king takes e6 that I have to calculate here. I also really have to reckon here with queen g8, or maybe just uh, to turn around the moves with bishop takes d4 check i suppose bishop takes d4 check is also an option right okay so let's calculate queen g8 but then okay he wants to take my rook then he's up uh up a piece but can't i solve the problem of my rook on e6 and the weakness of my g file in one go Yes, and of course, when visualization, when visualizing, sorry, you need to be creative about this. And uh, you need to have trust in your position and try to make it work for as long as it goes, right? Here, white has rookie two. And now, after um, rook takes d4 check, white has king h1, and after queen uh, d5 check white has rook g2 so he's up the exchange and still f5 is up for grabs and then after that he should be able somehow 
to defend against uh, the long diagonal and win the game. Okay, so it's very important to see that after rook, excuse me, after queen g8, you have a very good defense that solves the problem of the e6 rook, which is arm pre, and the weak g file by means of rook e2. Aha, so you stumble upon an idea, right? This is um, serendipity, the faculty of making happy or unhappy choices by accident. And there's a lot of serendipity in chess. You stumble upon an idea, and you can use this idea in other variations. So we've covered queen g8. Now, after rook e6, let's try and reverse the move order, which is always a very important technique in chess. Bishop takes d4 first, right? Well, if now c takes d4, that would be a mistake, because queen takes g8, uh, picks up the rook on e6, and it's four against four pawns, and it's no longer clear that black's king is uh, less safe than white's. And we've only really managed to exchange lots of minor pieces. And white is starting to have some weaknesses of his own, right? So this would really not be the way to go about it. And again, chess is not checkers, right? So bishop takes d4 check. Don't allow queen g8 check by taking on d4. You can also just move your king. And again here, king h1 is the best move. Because, again, after queen g8, aha, we have the stumble move, rook e2. And queen d5 check, rook g2. You can again stop calculating here when you see that f5 is up for grabs. And uh, the bishop on d4 is attacked now, so the bishop should move. Maybe it should move to here, so that at least the queen takes f5 check does not immediately exchange the queens. But now king c7 is the best move, because otherwise I would check you on the back rank. And now still I manage, if I want to, to exchange the queens. Now this, of course, relieves all the pressure of the long diagonal. And with the extra pawn and the extra exchange, white will simply win this endgame. So you can stop calculating. Okay, well, that means that after rook takes e6, I suppose um, there really is one... Uh, alternative left here and that is of course king takes e6 always the proof of the pudding is in the eating but now here comes white's point really queen takes f5 he has managed to eliminate the defender from f5 that was on e6 it was a pawn and he has also managed to eliminate the defender on f5 that was the knight on d6 right you remember that we started with bishop takes d6 and then we just crashed through, we annihilated the pawn on e6. And now we see why, because now the f5 square has become accessible. It was already directly attacked by the queen. It was not uh, really uh, attacked uh, directly by the rook on f1 because there was a bishop sitting here. But now that the bishop is out of the way, also, the rook has direct access to f5, so the rook can now support the queen. And of course, black now only has one legal move, so that's easy candidate calculation. King e7 is forced. And now, after queen f7 again, there's only one legal move, king d8. And now it's very easy to see that after queen g8 check and king c7, white is even winning the queen in the corner here with queen takes a8. Okay, well, I suppose that ends the quote-unquote sample of uh, correct chess thinking that you can use or should use for this position. Um, I'm curious to know, to hear uh, how far you got yourself with your training session, if you saw some of these lines, if you saw the most important points, and uh, as promised, in the video uh, earlier, we will now also have a quick look um, at rook takes e6 instead of knight takes e6. And of course, rook takes e6 um, is based on the same um, ideas of crashing through on the e6 square, weakening the defense of f5. And rook takes e6 was the other candidate uh, during the game when I played this combination. And now during my explanation, I focused mainly on knight takes e6. But for those of you who uh, calculated rook takes e6, we will just go uh, through rook takes e6 also. So there's the candidate of rook takes e6. 
Again, there's, of course, the candidate of queen g8, and again, there's the candidate of bishop d4. You know, it all revolves around the same ideas here. Okay, let's start with bishop takes d4. King h1 is a good move. Now, after queen g8, white can play rook takes h6, and uh, he remains up material. If now, for instance, uh, queen takes g5, then uh, black has to reckon with rook h7, for instance, and also his bishop on d4 is on pre, so this is winning. Um, so better after king h1, and rook h6 is not queen g8, but... Um, excuse me, after king h1, um, not queen g8, but rook takes e6, yes. And now white just simply continues uh, with knight takes e6, again, just taking with a piece on e6 there. Um, if now king takes e6, we have something similar as we saw earlier with queen takes f5. Um, but the funny thing is uh, that maybe now black can also try to make use of this king position by opening up the long diagonal without bringing his king to g8, his queen to g8. This is very funny, so he can try for c5 now. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't really work because of a knight takes uh, d4. White is a piece up here. After c takes d4, again, he crushes through on uh, f5. And rook b8, discovered check, uh, runs into knight f3. When after queen e4, white can go for the exchange of pieces. But that would bring uh, uh, a free pawn in the black uh, camp, so probably best would be here queen g2, and of course um, in the long run uh, uh, white should be able to win this position. <coughs> okay, so that was rook e6, bishop d4. But after rook e6 we should also look at queen g8. And this is of course attacking the rook on e6. And now, since the rook is on e6 rather than the knight, as in the the main explication, we can now try rook e6 takes h6. And, um, yeah, if now bishop takes d4, king h1, and again, queen takes g5, runs into uh, rook h7 check. So maybe black should try something else here, bishop takes h6. But here we go again. Queen takes f5 check. And... Um, I'm already two pawns up here, so I can even stop calculating here because I see that in the next move I have a very solid uh, defense of my knight here with h2, h4. So I could even stop calculating there, um, which is what we shall do because this is just to uh, highlight a practical point. We don't have to calculate any further here. We just uh, let black decide where he wants to put his king, how he wants to defend against his check, and then we start looking for some other moves. And, I mean, it would be very weird if somehow black now has a king move, after which we're completely lost, you know, which is not the case, of course. Just look at the position, you know, you, you have to feel confident uh, also at a, at a certain moment. So, we've also covered queen g8, which remains uh, rook takes e6, Rook takes e6, of course. When knight takes e6, um, and king e6 would run into queen f5, which is the same as in the main line. So I suppose we can just try queen g8 here. When um, the difference in the position now allows for knight takes g7. When queen d5 is nothing, uh, of course, there's not even a check, so you'd better recapture that guy. And now, again, after king h1, f5 is about to fall. Uh, so you may be better already sidestep um, that check with king c7. And now after queen takes f5, uh, white is up two pawns and should win this endgame. Okay, well, that ends the explication of our first drill. I think it's very useful, or hopefully can be very useful for you, to see our chess thinking skills in action. You know, we've done an orientation of the position, we've figured out, uh, using a little bit of the planning approach, uh, what the position is about, then we asked ourselves the questions, are there any threats? Well, the threat, quote-unquote, was that maybe Black uh, very quickly wants to um, add defensive pieces to the center and the king side. Most notably, queen g8 was an important move to try and overprotect e6. 
And then uh, we figured out that the position was uh, not a position in which we can move immediately and that it is uh, tactical in nature with so many weaknesses and captures and discoveries, etc. So we started looking for candidate moves that are in accordance with these tactical motifs. And then we did some very proper uh, calculate uh, candidate f searching. And of course, when it was our move, we chose to go first with one particular candidate. And when we played that candidate, we started looking for different defenses for the opponent, most notably counterattacks, you know. And we've also seen on a number of occasions a number of occasions, which is characteristic for counterattacks, is that you're not very brave. Um, no, brave is not the word. That you're not uh, walking in line by just uh, recapturing the captured material, but that you make an in-between move. In-between moves, counterattacks, are a very important tool for the defender, so you should always be on the lookout, you know. Never expect uh, your opponent to apply with your plans, you know, and um, being brought to the gallow uh, without putting up a fight, right? So that's what made us find moves such as queen g8 or uh, bishop takes d4, you know, things opening up diagonals or files, etc., etc. Okay, in the end it didn't work, but we had to figure out these candidates, right? Because there was this very exciting moment where after um, rook g8, we had to find bishop e2, where for a moment we had to solve our own problems of the rook on e8 and of course the weak g file. But once we found it, and we see that after queen d5 we have rook g2, oof, we can quite safely say, okay, this is working and we're going to win this position. So, that's what we did. We did a proper analytical um, analysis. And, okay, maybe now it takes me, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes to talk you through this video, or maybe even longer. I'll just have to check in a, in a few seconds. But normally, uh, of course, you try and do it a bit quicker in your own game. But um, this is always a little bit the difficulty. And um, you will get more confident about it and you'll probably do quicker the more you do these drills or the more you just practice your chess in general. But if you go into such a mechanism, like a Swiss watch, this is a combination, you just really have to make sure that all the defenses and most notably the counter attacks don't really work, you know, because otherwise you just screw up an otherwise beautiful position. And this is maybe also a little bit the difference between positional players and tactical players. And if there would have been a position a little bit more complicated and difficult than this, I'm sure that Kasparov still would have found the win, but that Karpov would have tried uh, to make a more pragmatic choice. He would have played something else, you know. Um, of course, uh, let's make no mistake about it. This is also a position that Karpov would have been able to solve, of course. I mean, if I can solve it in a game, of course, Karpov would be able to solve it. Let's not forget that he was the 12th world champion, you know, and he's a much better tactician and calculator than, than I, of course. Um, but I'm just talking about style here. Um, so, if it gets too difficult, you know, if there are maybe too many um, uh, defenses, uh, counter ideas, and also, especially when you're in time trouble, then you're well advised not to go into such an adventure. Only go into such an adventure if you have some time on the clock and if you can make sure that um, you know all the main ideas work for you. And also try your um, try to use your smart thinking, right? Uh, know where to stop calculating and try to stop calculating your lines as soon as you can because then you save time. So always try to be uh, smart-minded about these things. Okay, well, I think I've said enough. I hope you've enjoyed this example. More drills coming up. Okay, bye-bye.